So um, today I'm going to talk about a perhaps something that our practice is not always associated with, which is a uh, at least for me after 20, 22 years of practice, my first multi-storied residential building in that too in Bombay. Um, it's located at the 19th Road in Khar. So it's a wonderful location. It's for a single large family. Wonderful, wonderful people. I owe them a lot uh, for being able to understand uh, and assimilate, and where not fully understand at least to accept um, certain ideas that we proposed. Look, the moment you get into a city like Bombay, there is there is a fair amount of pressure of both the past and of the current situation of density restrictions, building codes, FSI. and what it's led to fundamentally if you look at our built environment is this kind of homogenized attitude to multi-story buildings where it's become more of a logistical and infrastructural exercise and then it's about ornamentation sticking stuff on putting glasses everywhere right so a lot of the 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 core idea the essence of architecture needing to address the idea of shelter of climate of uh the sun the rain of living environments of you know equitable living environments tends to be ignored in favor of just literally setting up repetitive floor plates sticking stuff onto it and then getting an interior designer to start creating other artificial environments inside so i think for us really if i go back to kanchenjunga right uh with Charles and Pravina and it's an absolute masterpiece and what's beautiful is that he is actually toned down all of the notions that have been enforced upon us to look at a building type that responds to all that I've spoken of and also in a way becomes a a discourse at work the building is also not just an object it's not just an organism it's also an idea right and that's really for me uh, you know a major inspiration so when we talk about a multi generational family they have their own sets of requirements they want certain separations the site long and narrow it's got a beautiful view to the west um overlooking khar danda and then the sea beyond right and if you even if you travel along the west whether it's the, the you know the, the sea link or the coastal road or whatever and you look at the skyline of bombay it looks absolutely generic it could be singapore it could be dubai it could be anywhere and everywhere there are glass buildings the residential ones are fundamentally nothing more and if you draw a kind of extended skyline there you're just seeing buildings of different heights right and i'm going to leave a little space as a question mark here and it's just doing this and everything is broken up into lines of slabs right and then glasses in between this is the morphology that has been forced upon us so question mark is this the only way to go right that's one way we talk about it now from the idea of the urban artifact but we're not first talking about an image that gets reverse engineered into a program um the west causes a serious problem for buildings in bombay because it's got the best views to the sea right but it's also got the harshest sun so when the sun drops 2 pm to 5 pm everyone's blinds come down all your views are gone sun is lashing you there is no protection and the same thing happens for your 4 to 6 months of monsoon where the west monsoon is the worst and it lashes horizontally so people design these balconies on the 50th floor but then no one can use them because it's hot it's wet you know so really we have to reach back to i won't say tradition but perhaps vernacular archetypes right we look at courtyards we look at deep shaded verandas we look at protection we look at cross ventilation we look at natural light we look at natural uh, cooling techniques are all these ideas even possible right within the constraints and preoccupations of a tall building and that's where the story for this project starts it's about voiding the ground letting nature flow because ultimately it's been two and three storied old bungalows that have been demolished to make way for these tall buildings 
Those bungalows had a certain grace in terms of how they reacted to the street, the way they set themselves back, they were protected by landscape. Now it's all lobbies and car parks and built up forms. So how do you let the building both physically and notionally recede, at least at the ground level? How do you look at the idea of the way that you would design a house on the ground, but then start to articulate it as it moves up, right? So the core ideas of the building, if I were to draw them and you have, um, you know, a little kink in this site, otherwise it's approximately, um, I think 33 meters by about 17 meters, you have setbacks. The maximum allowable build building footprint was 26 meters by nine meters, right? It's not a large floor plate. It also takes another 400 to 500 square feet away once we've put in your elevators and your staircase, that's your south, north, east, west, this is where we have, you see, so we've started intertwining and stacking these in a way. So if you look at the building section, right, and we've managed to open up the ground by putting in a very limited footprint of a lobby, then there is another internally staggered floor that works as their gym, the rest is all landscape, single level apartment, three level space, two level space for the other part of the family, three level space, and then a multi-purpose uh, floor for them, and then the terrace, right? The west has been thickened up by 2.4 meters, which is only a series of in-between verandas, patios at multiple levels. So you start to shade from the sun and the rain. So this almost becomes like the veranda buffers that you would see in our old Konkan architecture. Right? The building lines are sitting inside where your glazing lines are, so you don't see any glass from the exterior. What you see are a series of operable screens, 2 millimeter aluminum. It allows you to use these spaces the way you want. So someone opens it, someone closes it, somewhere it's half open, the building is organic, it's an organism, it's fluid, it has no fixed image. A similar Treatment starts to happen on the east because there you're dealing with the morning sun. The center of the building, at least restricted to the individual dwellings, becomes the angan. And the spaces then move to the east and west. The deep services sit in the south, so your kitchens. There are Marwari family, so Vastu is non-negotiable. Right? Not just basic Vastu, we are talking about orientations of WCs, etc., etc., right? And the house essentially breathes through and through because you've got the courtyard, you've got spaces, you've got the deep buffers happening over here. And when you start to look at the northern edge of the building, the clients obviously said it's north, let's put lots of glass, etc., etc. And we took them back to this diagram and said, if you put extensive amounts of glass on your building, you're going to be living in a fishbowl where everyone is staring at you. Look around you. Right? So the north became an interpretation of the way the houses have been planned, which is why when you look at how the windows have been dealt with as that kind of musical score on the north, it might seem utterly abstract on the exterior, but the logic emerges from the interior. This is the larger order of the building, but as you go deeper, this is something that can keep you can keep peeling away layers and, layers and see uh, different orders, clarities and logics emerging from large to small. The individual homes have resisted the preoccupation of the high-rise by setting themselves away from the facade, allowing elements of north lights, vertical spaces, the way the staircases have been oriented. It changes from ground to first, it changes from first to second, the way privacy has been modulated it is almost the attitude and the archetype of the standalone home that has found its way into the high rise, not high rise, but maybe medium rise, it's 52 meters tall. You maintain the order of the vertical structures and services, but the homes start to breathe and move, so they start to become these living organisms. And what's really interesting about this is how the discourse has transformed. When we first spoke to the clients, their reference was the JW Marriott, which had just opened at the airport. So it was all glossy marbles and veneers and all these trappings of luxury. The discourse has shifted to simple quota stones, 
raw concrete, no false ceilings. The client today tells me that he doesn't need to switch a light on in this house until the sun sets. Because the way we have designed the screens, the openings, you get soft glare-free light through the day. He doesn't need to switch his ACs on until he goes to sleep. Because with fans and cross ventilation, the house is established a nice microclimate. The first thing he does when he comes home, he and his wife, they go and sit in that balcony because they are protected from the sun. They have their morning tea, they do their yoga, etc. Right? It's really interesting how we've gone from these, these weird interpretations of what privilege and luxury are and the entire discourse has shifted. This is what he tells his friends, this is what he talks to us about. So the idea of a building as an idea, as a discourse, as a living organism, right? It is a plausible reality. There are ways to deal with this. And when you look at this from a distance, there's no fixed image. You can't tell the number of floors, right? So when we go back to this, you find the building has now become this kind of series of voids, this series almost like a Jenga model, and it keeps changing based on who's living there, what time of day, what time of year. It is not open to an instant analysis. Its anatomy reveals itself through careful observation, right? So in a way, it is a reflection of the larger essential discourse of the practice pushed into a fairly difficult, dense and urban environment.